thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to come here today and talk to you briefly about our molecular imaging resources and re research at UC Davis. It's 20 minutes, and I'll try and stick to my 20 minutes. So there's a lot. I really want to give you an overview of our resources and, and a couple of research subjects we're working on, and really talking about how we're trying to take our basic research from the bench to the bedside. Um, as you've already heard, um, I'm in biomedical engineering and internal medicine, but my basic training is in uh, chemistry and specializing in radiochemistry. And I'm hoping that really the next 20 minutes is just going to set the stage to open up some dialogue uh, for potential collaborations in the future. So you already heard that buzzword this morning uh, in the first session, molecular imaging, but I realize it's a very diverse audience. So what is molecular imaging? Well, we all go online and we all Google. Google has a very interesting definition. Cam, I'm sorry, but Google would tell you MRI is sadly not molecular imaging. But I agree with you, it truly can be molecular imaging with targeted imaging agents. So the Society of Nuclear Medicine uh, came up with a definition several years ago that molecular imaging is the visualization, characterization, and measurement of biological processes at the cell and molecular level in humans and other living systems. Systems. Let's put that into context of the patients, because we really are all here, I'm sure, to advance patient care. So for those of you not familiar with PET, this is a, whoops, that's a group, sorry. This is a human PET CT scan after a patient's been injected with a radioactive sugar. That sugar goes to all areas of increased, group, increased, increased sorry, glucose metabolism. So in the normal patient, you get uptake in brain, in heart, and this radio trace is excreted through the kidneys and the bladder. So how can this help in patients with cancer? Well, here you see an FDG scan of a patient before and after treatment with Zevalin, radioimmunoconjugate that targets CD20 in lymphomas. Now in this patient, even as a chemist, I can see there are a lot of hot spots up here which is disease. After treatment, these hot spots disappeared. This is showing that this patient is responding to treatment. A normal response is monitored by tumor, physical tumor shrinkage using CT and MR. Well, physical tumor shrinkage can take days, weeks, and often months. Visualizing using molecular imaging, you can see this on pretty much the same day. Studies with, for example, IRISA and Gafitnib were using FDG PET the day after treatment, and they were seeing immediate shutdown in glucose metabolism. So really, molecular imaging is going to help us with advancing personalized medicine, much earlier detection, monitoring treatment, and efficacy of treatment. This patient responded, but many patients don't. So we want to be able to use imaging to stratify patients in their therapy. That's wonderful. But what does a successful molecular imaging group need? It needs a lot of, it's truly one of the areas of interdisciplinary research. You're hearing that word a lot already today about interdisciplinary <coughs> research. But for molecular imaging, it really cannot succeed without a diverse um, um, workforce. So we have here from UC Davis, unfortunately, our um, head of our cancer center, Rave Tavir White, could not be here today. Rick Bold, he's a surgeon. Kit Lam, he's a hematologist oncologist. Simon Cherry, he's a physicist. Myself, a chemist. Sandy is a pathologist. Uh, Jan is a stem cell biologist. Um, I'm blanking on her name now. She's a molecular biologist. Uh, Karen Kelly is head of our clinical trials. Lucky Lara, co-director of our clinical trials. Lark Birdland, head of our cl clinical translational science center. And obviously, you need support from your leadership. So this is our Vice Dean, Fred Myers. You also need a lot of equipment um, for radiochemistry. You need a cyclotron. Uh, you need a lot of shielding for radiochemistry. And also, you need a lot of, once you've got your radio tracers, you need the equipment to scan the patients. So you need a huge, huge, huge amount of physical infrastructure to be successful in molecular imaging. So what did that mean at UC Davis? They heavily, heavily invested in imaging. In about 2002, um, they hired about seven faculty in imaging. 
They also have a lot of um, imaging infrastructure, as you've heard already from Harris Lewin this morning, that we have the number one vet school, I believe, in the world now. And within the vet school, uh, we have pretty much a nuclear medicine department. So you have all the, reg sorry, the, um, the regular scanners, MR. Uh, we have in our preclinical imaging center, which I'm going to tell you <clears throat> a little bit more about because I co-direct that center. It's the state-of-the-art preclinical imaging center. We are not pet-centric. We do have all our imaging modalities there. So we have SPECT, we have optical, we have PET, we have MR, we have ultrasound. We have a dedicated biomedical cyclotron. Um, one thing to add about UC Davis that Vice Chancellor Lewin mentioned this morning is we do have a non-human primate center. It has five and a half thousand, thank you, non-human primates. And we've embraced imaging in there too. Uh, they had standard ultrasound and optical imaging in there, but more recently we installed a human PET CT scanner within our primate center. So put that into perspective of location, 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 because that it's all about, and I don't need to tell you because we have a lot of space at UC Davis. We probably have about eight mile radius of campus. Um, so we're fortunate that we can put up new buildings. So the imaging resources that I just mentioned, this is where they are. So we have our Center for Molecular Genomic Imaging in our Genomics and Biomedical Sciences facility. We have our vet med school here, and we have our primate center here. What we fail to mention is our school of medicine is 20 miles away, so if you do MapQuest, you turn left out of here, right out of here, and you get onto the freeway and travel 20 miles to our School of Medicine. I highlight this because this has been a challenge for us, particularly in the radiochemistry world when we're dealing with radioisotopes of two minutes, transferring compounds across what we call the causeway has been a challenge, but we've overcome that, and you'll see that later on. So just to home in a little bit um, on the center that I co-direct, the Center for Molecular and Genomic Imaging, it provides state-of-the-art instrumentation and expertise in in vivo imaging. Um, I co-direct this with my colleague Simon Cherry, so you combine my chemistry expertise with his physics expertise, but to be honest, we have a team of staff running it, and we, we just get to, to go and tell these stories about our wonderful imaging center. As you've seen, we're next to the primate center as well. We have over $10 million of equipment, state-of-the-art instrumentation and staff. And as I said, we, we um, have all modalities. We're not just pet-centric in there. But to highlight my, you know, my specialty in radiochemistry, inside our radiochemistry facility, we have our 11 MeV cyclotron. Um, this cyclotron is capable of producing the main PET tracers, like fluorine, isotopes fluorine 18, carbon 11, nitrogen 13, oxygen 15, and uh, we actually have developed solid targetry now there to radio label things with copper 64, so we have a longer half-life of 12 hours, gives us a little bit more flexibility. Um, once we have the radioisotopes, obviously everything's radioactive, so we can't do chemistry with our fingers. We have to be uh, shielded from the radiation. So you'll hear words like hot cells. These are not radioactive little cells. They're actually lead-shielded fume hoods where we work with our chemistry. As chemistry is being developed, we use robotic manipulators to actually do the chemistry. And once we've optimized it, we have automated devices. But I put this here to put it into perspective of the costs um, and the investments that UC Davis have made in, in imaging and in particular radiochemistry. So you have the cyclotron, 1.5 to $2 million. Each hot cell, $150,000. I don't know where they come up with these magic numbers. Everything's 150,000 or 2 million. Um, the manipulators actually, these are old prices now, are about $100,000. So you can see the investment for this lab alone for UC Davis was, which I'm truly grateful for, was about $5 million. And that doesn't include your staff and your operating costs. <coughs> but we have that. So what have we been doing with it so far? And I, I just pulled a couple of examples because we really have a, a lot of imaging studies at UC Davis, but this is just to reflect what we believe imaging and as we go to more translational imaging, what molecular imaging can do. 
And this is a study of regression, recurrence, and resistance. So as we normally, cancer patients become drug resistant during their treatment. So this was a mouse model of breast cancer developed at UC Davis by Bob Cardiff. It's the minnow mouse model, so the mammary intraepithelial neoplastic outgrowth model. And basically, this mimics breast cancer developed from hyperplasia right through to metastatic disease. It's a well-characterized model. And what this group did is they used PET to look at um, the drug resistance to rapamycin, the mTOR inhibitor. And so on day one, they used just FDG, so the radioactive sugar, injected it into the mouse. And you can see, as I said before, the normal brain, normal heart, kidneys, and bladder. But what you see in the mammary fat pad is the tumor. So they started this mouse on treatment. This is just a summary of the imaging. And gave the drug and imaged every day with the FDG. And you saw the tumor regress. They took the animal off the drug. They were carried on imaging. And you can see the tumor coming back in the fat pad. And then they carried on the next treatment. Well, this drug, became, this mouse became resistant because you did not see any shrinkage. So here's where a simple tracer, FDG is commercially available, can be used to monitor drug response, drug recurrence, and drug resistance. So Dr. Kit Lam, who I showed on our, one of the initial slides, uh, hematologist, oncologist, chair of our biochemistry and molecular medicine department. He's a chemist by training, although he's an oncologist, so he has some wonderful, often crazy ideas. And he uses combinatorial chemistry uh, to, uh, to develop therapeutics. But he's interested in, in treating and imaging lymphoma. And the target that he was interested in was a cell surface receptor, an integrin, alpha-4, beta-1. So he developed this peptidomimetic called LLP2A, and he put an optical dye on there. He put Psi 5.5 onto his molecule. And he went into a mouse model with a MOLT4 tumor, which, was alpha, which is alpha-4, beta-1 uh, positive. And you can see, you can see tumor uptake, but one of the challenges we have with optical imaging, even in mice, is the light penetration from the object. Um, so he could see it, but what he then subsequently did was he dissected the animal, then scanned the organs. And he found that the main uptake of his compound was actually in the tumor, but also in the kidneys. He then was working with our SPECT people, so the Donados, where he said, well, let's label this with indium. So he took the LLP2A and substituted this dye with a chelate for indium. And the Donados repeated the study. Unfortunately, they did it in a different tumor model. So this is a message as keeping things consistent, keeping your tumor models consistent. But the Rajiv tumor model was one they were familiar with, and it also expressed alpha-4 beta-1. But they saw the same correlation. Um, they did whole body autoradiography, so they sectioned the mouse. And you can see, they see their radioactive compound in the tumor and in the kidney. So then I arrive, and I'm the spec, the pet chemist. Well, pet's got this super sensitivity, super resolution, so let's give Julie our compound and see what she can do with it. So just remember, they have LLP2A with a chelate and indium. All I did was take that specked indium out and put copper 64, a PET emitter, in. So in theory, the molecule's the same. So we injected into the animal with, we actually had malt four tumors, so our tumors were identical. And we did not see what they saw. We saw this huge liver uptake and we really could scale it up, and we had to squint to see the tumors, but we could. And as I already said, Dr. Lam is very creative. This slide represents about five years, five years of work because he'd already gone on to multimerizing his LLP2A, pegalizing his LLT, LLP2A to improve pharmacokinetics. Well, the message here is multimodal imaging, but be careful because this clearly, these two compounds are almost identical. Do you know what the reason was? That metal that we put in popped straight out in the liver. It transchelated into the liver. And the only difference between these two compounds was that isotope. Fortunately, we had some great chemists working on new chelators for copper, and we did a cross-bridged um, daughter that actually keeps 
copper in and it doesn't pop out in the liver. From a chemistry point of view, challenges with that, to get your metal into that chelate, you have to heat it. So antibodies are not amenable to this. This is a peptidomimetic, so it was not a problem. So we did fix this problem by putting a different chelate on there, radio labeling with copper 64, re-injecting into a mouse, and all we saw was this beautiful tumor uptake. But that looks like a nice pretty slide, but it was five years of effort working you know, with, with and as I said, Dr. Lam's an MD. This is one I, this is a really, really old image, and I use this as marketing for molecular imaging to drug companies. Molecular imaging needs to be involved in drug discovery at phase zero, not at phase three, not at phase four. I can disclose this now because it's published. We work with Genentech a lot, and they came to us several years ago now and said, we have an armed antibody, uh, but we're having trouble with it because even when it's not armed with a toxin, ooh, I'm going way over, not armed with a toxin, um, we're killing all these mice. So I just said, well, come on, give me your antibody. We will ready label it. So we took their antibody and we put the daughter chelator on there already labeled it with copper 64 and injected it into a non-human primate. I don't have to tell you what happened. The whole skeleton of this monkey lit up and caught within minutes of injection and residualized in the, in the bone marrow. They were just wiping out. My question was to Genentech was, how much money have you spent so far? Multi-millions of dollars were spent developing that. And we told them within 15 minutes it's obvious, it's going everywhere. So I think really the message you know, for us is now, and we're working with a lot of drug companies, and drug com they, they don't like to hear it at phase three, obviously, but it's if we can engage them early and maybe identify their hits sooner, but more importantly, eliminate their losers earlier on. And Merck and Pfizer and people, companies like that in the US now are embracing imaging. In fact, Genentech, Genentech actually have three micro pets probably six of my students, four of my postdocs, people that have come through my lab actually now uh, work in the molecular imaging team at Genentech. So I have only a few more minutes, so I am gonna sadly skip my own work. Um, we are known for radiochemistry, um, but really we're about marrying technologies. I think most of you know that PET used to stand alone and CT used to stand alone, but the marriage of PET CT has really rev revolutionized nuclear medicine. We embrace technologies, so yes, we're radiochemists, but we have to think fast chemistry. We're working with short half-lives, but we've embraced things like antibody engineering and married that with PET. We're working with fab fragments, so smaller fragments of antibodies um, for what I call irrational drug design, when we know very little about a receptor, for example, and you want to do high throughput screening, we've embraced phage display and combinatorial chemistry and married that with radiochemistry. My lab is very diverse. I have um, chemical engineers, chemists, biomedical engineers, pharmacists, organic chemists, inorganic chemists, um, and more biomedical engineers. So. There are obviously a lot of engineers, so they have to develop technologies. And as I mentioned, we have to do chemistry remotely because of the radioactivity. So more recently, we're marrying uh, microfluidic devices with radiochemistry. So skipping through what we've done um, with our research, how about you know, this really has been, UC Davis is extremely well known for preclinical imaging. Um, our strength has not today been in translational imaging. So we set up to, to, to fix that problem. And moving over into the School of Medicine, as I told you, we have that 20 mile uh, barrier. But we have, fortunately, a team of really smart physicists uh, developing scanner technology. Uh, we have standard uh, PET CTs in our nuclear medicine department, but they're developing new scanners for PET imaging. This is, it was, well, John Boone is known for his CT. Obviously, Ramsey, Simon, and Abhijit are known for PET. Um, Dr. Boone built the first dedicated breast CT scanner, and basically, the breast hangs in the field of view, and the scanner moves around the breast. For, so for women who have mammography, you know this is much more appealing to you, but as the object hangs in the field of view, 
they've then now harnessed that. It's an extremity scanner. So they're now looking at um, imaging hands, for example. Um, FTG has a downside. It goes to sites of inflammation. But Abhijit's harnessed that technology to look at inflammation in rheumatoid arthritis. And the most recent development, am I... Is, is it official that it might be funded? I don't know. Um, so if I say it out loud, they have... Our colleagues have a, a fundable score with the NIH, should I say, to build a whole body um, PET scanner. So the scanners you know in the clinic now, the patient moves through a field of view. When they finish this scanner, it's two meters long, the patient will go in, be scanned, and come out. They're also building detectors with high resolution and sensitivity that you can inject one fiftieth of the radioactivity. So this is great for our field because most of you realize you mentioned the word nuclear and everybody goes, this will allow us to do normal volunteers, maybe imaging microbiota, things like that, but actually children as well. So this is going to be used. So I said it out loud, they have a fundable score, but this looks very promising. Um, to finish really on how we can move from bench to bedside, I talked to you about the um, institutional investment in preclinical imaging. It was a lot of money. Um, so you can imagine when I went to my dean four years ago and said, I need to have that $20 million again to set up in the School of Medicine. And she's extremely supportive and always has been and said, well, I can support you. I can give you your faculty appointment, which was when I became School of Medicine. I can give you space. But I do not have $20 million to set up this facility. So we got creative and we went out and did a public-private partnership and we partnered with Siemens Healthcare, uh, specifically PetNet Solutions, who distribute FDG throughout the United States. And about two years ago, this is the blueprints, we set up a commercial pharmacy next to a non-for-profit next to my new radiochemistry research and training facility. This is a 12,000 square foot facility and when I asked for a cyclotron, I actually got two, which was kind of nice. So to be honest, this is now what it looks like. You see me happy with more hair than I have now. A very nice, shiny facility. Just to highlight, you know, we're from preclinical imaging. Our standards are very different. Obviously, if you're going into the clinic, we have good manufacturing to deal with. We have the FDA to deal with. So now we have a GMP uh, facility over in the, in the School of Medicine for radiopharmaceutical production uh, for human studies. And I'm going to click uh, onto this because I probably have about one minute to finish. Um, where are we at really? We have a unique opportunity now to do a lot of the standard uh, clinical probes in patients, but we also have this opportunity to do first in human studies. You know, we are developing new tracers and we want to get them from the bench into the bedside. We have to go through a lot of testing, a lot of compound optimization, a lot of preclinical work. And this is where we're at right now. And again, thank you to you heard about the RISE funding. Vice Chancellor Lewin has helped support this part, Ooh, sorry, this part, which is a, a huge challenge. We do all the chemistry, we do all the basic research, we do all the exciting stuff, and then we have to do all the paperwork for the FDA and all the toxicity studies, and they're very expensive. Um, one compound is about $150,000 just for the tox studies to get into the clinic. Uh, and the RISE money actually uh, funded that. We used the the primate center to screen one of our compounds that we'd spent several years optimizing in the mouse, got it down to six lead compounds, and went through non-human primates to really give us a feel for was the mouse really telling us what was gonna happen when we went in the clinic. And more from a targeting point of view, ease of synthesis point of view, affinity point of view, bringing all these criteria together to select the one compound that was gonna go into the clinic. And that's where we're at right now, uh, preparing our paperwork for the IND. Uh, we hope to file it with the FDA after getting our talk studies in June and do our first in human studies uh, with one of my own compounds uh, in the, probably in about August. But to finish with more for the dialogue here, you see the resources that we have on all these toys, but we have a challenge with the workforce. 
Um, not just for nuclear chemistry. I mean, there are many reports out there, the last one being from the National Academy stating the national need for a workforce in nuclear chemistry and radiochemistry in the US, but also for nuclear medicine in general. The fundamental nuclear chemistry training is significantly lacking. I'm fortunate to have um, some DOE funding to fund radiochemists, and my most recent one is actually an interesting approach from DOE is to fund MDs and PhDs to work together. And as we've said, this truly is an interdisciplinary field. Uh, Roger and I have started some dialogue now. We're actually going to have a postdoc exchange to start with, but we're hoping the next few days we're going to talk about the opportunity to really leverage. I show you all these toys, and it's not here to show off. I want to say our toys are your toys. You can come and use our research, but resources, but how can we really have this collaborative effort now, and I think the training program is a, is a really unique opportunity for us. So with that, I should stop. Thank you. Thank you.